Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's joy. There's peace. Father, we recognize that you're here. You come before us, Father. You set the path straight, Lord. And Father, we ask for your, your anointing right now upon this worship. Bring your four winds into this place. Blow upon us, Father God. Bring life into this place, Lord. We want to celebrate you, Father. We want to worship your name in freedom, God. And when we try something new today, we, I want to invite you to come up in the front here to worship him. You don't have to be forced. That's your choice. But come up and let's just worship him together. Feel free in your worship. Thank you, Lord. So we're going to celebrate him right now. We're going to declare his praise. Amen? Let's sing this song together. Our God. Yes, Lord.
invite the children to come forward and as they do would you extend the love of Christ would you extend the aloha of Christ to one another amen good amen? amen we are so glad to be together as God's children if we could have that slide come up we are so grateful that in this community we have children's ministry amen, amen. and not only do we have a wonderful preschool director Karen Maluo and Debbie and Millie and all the volunteers that are here Monday through Friday we also have Sunday offerings, and we wanted to just give you a little information about our Sunday offerings. Is that okay? That sounds good. Uh, here are our Sunday offerings. We have Sunday school that runs from 9 a.m. until 10.15. That's where we learn and grow together with Jesus. Not only that, we have what we call children's church. What do we call it? See, they get it too. They get it too. Children's Church, that runs from 10.45 through noon. So, that will be happening soon enough. And we are also blessed in having a nursery here. Next slide, please. This is our Sunday school, in case you wanted to know, as parents or grandparents. We do look after elementary grades and preschool and kindergarten and I want to just give a big hand to Edith, to Valerie, Lydia, Wendy, thank you, uh, to Nobu and Violet, uh, to Janice and Bernard and Joni. Thank you to all who love our children. That's what we offer in the first part. Now, what do we offer in Children's Church? Pretty much the same thing. And one of our special folks that I wanted to give some time to today is Beth Araki. If I could have a, a microphone, please. Good wonderful servant, John. This is Beth, let's give it up for Beth. And Beth helps out with our children's church. What's on your heart, sister? Hello? We're gonna get another microphone, praise God. We have lots of schools, we have lots of microphones. <laughs> okay, good morning. Good morning. So, um, I was asked to come up and share a little bit about children's church. Um, the thing that I wanted to share with you is that as a parent um, and as someone that helps with the children's ministry, one of the things that has drawn our family to Kalahi Union Church is more than the offerings that you see on the front. Um, when my kids were little, I made a list and I thought, when my children grow up, what are all of the qualities and characteristics that I hope they will have obtained 
by the time they leave our house. We have a, a son that's getting ready to graduate, or he just graduated, getting ready to go to college. So I went through that list and I was like, okay, we, we did this, this, this. And I realized that all of those things early on, I wanted them to have a servant's heart, I wanted them to love the Lord, I wanted them to desire to lead, I wanted them to um, have compassion. And I realized they're not just gonna all of a sudden have those things. They need to have opportunities to develop those things. Mm -hmm. And they need to be around people that model those things. Yeah. And so as my husband and I were deciding where we were going to just settle back down into a church, we came on an Easter and I looked around and what I saw was a church body committed to kids. Mm -hmm. I saw them committed to kids from the youngest to the college age. And I saw ministry happening being led by kids, by youth, by young people. So on any given Sunday, if you were to go into one of the children's ministry things, or even the summer fun that they just had, you would see young people involved in ministry. Mm. And so that is just such a valuable thing. It's something that goes beyond the hour they might spend in Sunday school or in children's church. Those things are so important and we're committed to giving them just a really good foundation of biblical truths but also giving them an opportunity to serve, even within the children's ministry. The other thing is community. And at Kalihi Union Church, you know, they say that by the time kids reach going to college, a lot of them fall away from the Lord. I really believe that one of the things that keeps kids going in the Lord is the foundation they have in the, in the Word and with the relationship, but also community, because they have those relationships that keeps them going, that keeps them coming back, and when they go to look for new churches on their own, it becomes a heartbeat and a priority for them. So we see that here at Kalihi Union Church. From the second time we came, we came the first time, people introduced themselves. But every week I see people, you guys loving on my kids. I see people coming up and calling them by name, asking them questions. And I see that with you doing it with all of these other young people. That's community, and that is something that is so precious. Not all churches have that, so it's just so, so important. And then the last thing is that the vision and ministry that goes on with Clean Union Church, it's not just built around one person. And like you, it's very sad when Megan uh, made her announcement last week. Mm -hmm. But the thing that is so um, glorious is that ministry continues going on because it's not built around one person. It's built around all of us, it's built around the leadership and their commitment to the ministry that goes on. So um, anyway, I'm excited to be able to continue filling in until Trisha comes back, which is in the end of September. And if anyone is, wants to and has a heart and wants to get involved, you can come and see me. And when Trisha comes, we get everything plugged in and she has a little training. Um, we'd love to have you come and partner with us in the children. All right? Amen. Thank you so much. Okay, this is Beth Araki, bless you. So that's what we're offering, and this is Karen Malur. She's our preschool director. Give it up. Good morning. And Karen is going to oversee uh, this period where we look after Sunday school and children's church and the preschool. So please pray for Karen as she oversees all of that. And do you want to speak a little bit about our uh, offerings about uh, children's protocol and security? Well, so one of the things uh, that I think is the first thing that we do is to continue to support those who have faithfully come to, to minister to your children. I mean, if you have the chance to walk through, uh, this is the first weekend that I got to walk through all the classrooms to see who comes religiously and faithfully to love on your children. If you can do that and love on them, first and foremost, um, that would be great, and that is my first priority, is to continue to support the teams that have been carrying it thus far. Uh, one of the other things that we want to try to uh, implement as soon as possible is the security. Um, our, our children are very important to us, and when you give them to us, we want to ensure that you know yeah. that they are going to be safe and that they have a wonderful and fun environment to be in. And so my job is to just kind of pull them together um, closer so that we can keep a better eye on them. And so uh, starting uh, next week, Sunday, we are, our Children's Church 1045 will be all in the B, B building, consolidated together, right. if you can see it up there. And the check-in is at 1030. Yep. 
10.30 to 10.45. So if you can drop them there before coming to here, uh, that would be great. You will see that you will get a name tag that has the numbers that correlate to your child. So your name, your name tag will have the same number as your child, and that name tag needs to be on you when you uh, come back to get your children so that we know that parents and children are reunited together. And we have these flyers at the back, so pick those up for either the Sunday school or the children's church. Thank you so much. Let's uh, thank you, Karen. And right now, you have the opportunity to go to that uh, classroom area. And guess what we're going to be doing? Can you guess what we're going to be doing here? We are going to experience Jesus. Anybody say amen? Amen. That's what us kids are going to do this side. And I hope that you as children will experience Jesus in the other building on the same campus. Can I pray for you? Lord, help us experience you in many ways, knowing that even though life has its ups and downs and twists and turns, that you're always there. Is there ever a time when you're not here, Lord? No. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much as your children. You are the Son of God. And we're invited to be sons and daughters too. We bless our children in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, go get them. Have some fun. That's what we're going to do. church is ever busy, wouldn't you agree? Pastor John, what's going on first of all? Do we have some people to greet? We do. Okay, you take that one. All right. We do. (laughs) Like to welcome back Erin Evangelista uh, from her mission trip from Tanzania. Is she here today? She is, yeah, in the back over there. Welcome back. Also, um, Ruth and Manny Bringus, they were here in the first service. And they're still here. They're still here. Praise God. Wow. Just a quick word, these are servants who serve overseas in a special country for the purposes of our Lord. Thank you so much for coming today and being with us. We love you. And not only that, we also have the Yamauchis, I believe. Right, Ross. Is Ross in the house? Yay! Ross is also with his family serving in Japan. Ida All right, praise the Lord, great, all right. So if you are a guest, we are so glad that you're here today. Thanks for coming. We hope that you experience Jesus today through us. And actually our service will be a little different. We will be having a little message followed by music. And then another little message followed by music. This is gonna be more experiential today. So we pray that you'll work with that and, and Take in Jesus through all of that. But we also have some other things to share with you. What else do we have? Uh, we've got some ministry highlights that we want to share. Our Equip and Train conference is coming up on August 3rd and 4th. Are you guys excited? Yeah. It's going to be focused on our Ohana groups. Um, I'd like to present to you three M's, three purposes of our uh, e-conference. The first one is multiplication. We're to grow and expand our Ohana group ministry, our small group ministry. Our hope is to create more Ohana groups that will be meeting throughout the island here. Our second M is maturity. We want to strengthen and further equip already meeting Ohana groups. So we want to you know, foster deeper, deeper biblical um, study and fellowship and uh, sharing prayer with one another. We want to foster those things in our Ohana groups. And also, lastly, mission. Um, we're called to, to different you know, places. God has called us in different ways. And it's just, just not focused on our Ohana groups, but our whole uh, ministry here at KUC. So the call is to further equip ourselves, be prepared for ministry as we serve the gospel uh, in our communities, in our families, and, and in the nations. Wonderful. And that's this Friday and Saturday. Bring your yes. friends. It's going to be in the gym. What do we have next? I believe we have big questions. What do we have? This is Alan Nakamura. Give it up. Hi. We have a team here. But um, before uh, we go do the big questions, I want to introduce Kathy 
Kathy Paolo Hirai, she's over there sitting with her husband. Okay. So um, starting next Sunday in the gym, we have the big questions and by the big balloons. And um, it starts at nine and it's a joint session. So all the Sunday school classes will be in the gym for the big questions. And our first speaker is Pastor Clive, and he's going to be doing the over, overview and study one. So we just want to encourage everyone to come out to the big question. That's our new Sunday school term for the fall. And um, by the way, if you come early, the, um, the refreshments will be in the gym uh, this coming Sunday. So you have to go to the gym and stay for the class. Okay? So, okay. I get it. So okay. again, you know, this is the... Big questions? We have, one, we have one small question for you. Will, Will you, you join, join us for the big, big question Sunday school classes? Very good. Thanks very much. We appreciate that. Now, we are not finished yet. There's still more that we are yet offering. I will be teaching an all church Bible teaching series through the first epistle of John. And we are going to go deeper on Tuesday evenings. Which evening? Tuesday. And Thursday evenings? Thursday. Right, and also Wednesday mornings. We'll be in here in the sanctuary. Come and join us. It's going to be a time where we experience the fellowship of God. And we will be offering, you can see April, dear sister April, child care on Thursday evenings. Whoop, whoop. I love it. That's great. Thank you, Lord. Okay, next. What else do we have? Yes, tech, audio, and visual. Lane, are you, do you have a microphone there? Uh, do you have anything you want to add on this? Basically, go for it, Lane. Thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, you know, we are pretty put together. You like to think that tech, the tech team or the tech ministry is put together well, and, and we are, but uh, it doesn't mean that we don't need help. And um, we're always looking for support. And so we have a, a sign-up booth in the back. Um, and basically, if you feel like you can contribute in any way for audio or pro presenter the lyrics, all this, all this um, takes manpower to, to do every Sunday. And if the more people that we can um, support, um, the more rotation we can have and it'd be a lot easier. So in the back, they're in the back. Can we give a round of applause to them? They're always in the, 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 back, the background and they do a great job. And I also want to plug that we will be having an, an open house next week as well too. So, and uh, Dunkin' Donuts and coffee are going to be there. So, you should too. So, all right. That's it. That's me. I, I like that guy, Dunkin' Donuts. That's great. And um, John, what do we have next? Tomorrow is our 24-hour prayer uh, meeting in the chapel. Love for you to sign up. It's our monthly gathering of prayer here at KUC. So please, please sign up. Praise God. Okay, thank you, John. Appreciate your help this morning. Um, if I can ask Lane just to play any kind of music at this point. But it's, it doesn't matter. Um, welcome to Kalihi Union Church. This is the house of the Lord, amen? I mean, this is the house of the Lord. But don't you know that you're a dwelling place for Jesus yourself. Don't you know that, that you're a dwelling place for Jesus? I cannot tell you how excited I am to be here today. Joy is just bubbling up. Because I've been blessed with spending a lot of time recently with Jesus. And we tried various things which ultimately couldn't work out. And we tried other things that we hope today will work out. It's a time for you to experience Jesus today. And to use the pun, it will be experiential. Don't get lost in the experience. Get lost in Jesus. That's our pre prayer today. So here's the first slide. It's about fellowship in the light of God's life-giving love. And I looked on the Google thing, Lord, I, I need a, a picture, some kind of picture. I couldn't come up with one, but Brad could. Brad came up with this picture, 
And I want to tell you how much I love this guy, Brad. He, he just has a way of putting things together, and it's part of the union of Christ that's developing here. That's just an incredible picture, and it's, there's a pathway here that we're all on. We want, to, we want to experience you, Jesus. Amen. And that experience, again, it's not just this Netflix thing or Amazon.com or whatever it may be, but it's true fellowship. Fellowship in what? In, in the light. Because we all live in the dark in some way. We all live in the dark. So we're talking today about fellowship in the light of God's life-giving love. And here is this passage. It's going to come up on the screen. It's probably going to be too small, but if you have a phone, if you have a Bible, if you have a friend who's memorized the Scripture, it comes from the first epistle of John. And first epistle of John is found in the New Testament, somewhere between Genesis and Revelation. And it's written by this man, John, known as the Beloved. And he begins this epistle with these words, and if you have great eyes, praise God, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard and which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands. You know what he's talking about, don't you? Concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too, you too, even here today, that you too may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Experiences, we've all had them, right? Um, last night I experienced one of the 31 flavors. <laughs> Chocolate. <laughs> it's a good experience. Some of us this week, right, brothers and sisters, some of this week have experienced our sister in a room, in a hospital, that we don't, really don't want her to be there. And as we went into that hospital room with Gay, as we were with her and as we left, we had an experience. And there's a response that comes out of that experience. God brings experiences to us and we have reflections. Today we want to see John's experience because he experienced Jesus and what he does with that and why. As I said, we're going to do this message in four parts because there's four verses. A mini message followed by music and for verse one, and then we'll continue till we finish. And as Lane leads us through these songs with all of these wonderful brothers and sisters, I pray that you'll experience Christ yourself and that you'll reflect. So who is this guy, John? Well, John is 90 years old. Do we have anybody here who's 90? Anybody who's 90? I'm not quite there yet. Four generations after Christ has risen. Think about that. Here is this man, four generations after Christ has risen from the grave. And he still affects him. Do you hear that? His passion for Jesus still hasn't changed. Even four generations. His passion with Jesus still hasn't changed. And he writes this letter, and I believe that when the people read that letter in their communities, they were like this. And if I could take your picture today and throw it up on the PowerPoint, you'd look just like these folks. It's incredible, isn't it? He writes to little children. That's how much he loves them. Little children. Men and women, really. Men and women who are beloved. And who are they beloved by? Alan? God. They're loved by God. Because God who loves them. Now, of course, he's 90, but at one point he was a young man. He was a young man, and he's often represented with this eagle. And, you know, I Googled this, and this picture kind of looks a little scary to me. Um, because this eagle... But if we understand that the eagle has incredible vision, right? Any eagle has incredible vision, and the eagles fly in the heavenlies, 
This is a great representation of John the Apostle. Because this man was given a great vision of God. Amen? And in some sense, when he wrote that book of Revelation, he was taken up into the heavenlies. And what would this old man, who wrote much of this work, what would he say to this young man? A young man that many believe actually was Christ's relative. So I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but many believe that John the Apostle was a first cousin once removed from Jesus. See, John's father was Zebedee and his mother was Mary Salome. And Mary Salome was the daughter of Cleopas. And that would be his grandfather, Grandfather Cleopas. And guess who Cleopas's brother was? A certain carpenter named Joseph. So they're in the family. What would the old man say to this young man back then? It's a family of some wealth. How do we know it has wealth? Well, they're fishermen, but they have their own boats. I don't have a boat. And if you guys own a boat, that's an expensive thing to have. They own their own boats. There's some wealth there, some connection in their neighborhood. Um, There's lots going on with this young man. He even has physical ties with Jesus. But most importantly, beyond all of those things, here's what happens to this man. He's called. Jesus calls to him. And that's what's happening for here for you today. I don't care whether you're old or young, whether you're English or Filipino, Chinese, Japanese, you're being called. Every one of us, we're being called. Because he loves you. He was connected with John the Baptist. I'm not sure how that happened, but he was. And I'm pretty sure that John the Apostle heard John the Baptist say these words, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Can you imagine being there in that experience? Wow. This man, Jesus, comes into his life. Powerful. Sins of the world indeed. That's what Jesus came, to take away the sins of the world. And John is not immune to that. Uh, I wanted to have this kind of grayscale picture here because it's kind of dark. John was a sinner. A worker, sure, from a local neighborhood, someone with family ties, someone like you and me. And he lived in the mundane, he lived in the uncommon, he lived in the everyday. But nonetheless, this man, John the Apostle, was a sinner. But here's the beauty. Look at this beautiful, colorful picture. Jesus prays for this man. Do you think that today Jesus Christ is praying for gay goo? Do you think that? I believe it. Do you think that Jesus is praying for Lionel? I believe it. Do you think he's praying for Ke- uh, Talis and Ke- Keenan? Do you think he's praying for us today? Do you think he's praying for you, Howard? I believe that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father and he's praying for us. And that's powerful because he's the God-man who loves us so. The Gospels tell us so. Never ceasing to pray, Jesus is our advocate. He loves you. He loves you so much. He prays for us. John is the writer of this letter, 1 John. And he lived as we do in places behind doors. You ever sense that? That you live in places behind doors? But guess what Jesus wants to do? He wants to break on through. Amen? This is not just some Jim Morrison song. Jesus wants to break on through. Because he wants to come into our lives. Beyond this earthly world, there is a lamb, the light of the world. And just to say this about John and who he is, he has ambition. Now, if you look at the ambition, I'll make this summary statement. This ambition causes strife, it causes indignation, and it even causes resentment. Here's how we know. Talking to Jesus, James and his brother said this to Jesus. Can you imagine saying this? Here it is. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. Can you imagine saying that to Jesus? We want you to do whatever we ask. And here's the response of the other ten disciples. When they heard this, they became indignant 
They resented James and John. That's what earthly ambitions do. They bring about indignation and resentment, even strife. And here's how Jesus responded. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Do you have earthly ambitions today? I'm sure we do. But if you experience Jesus, all your ambitions will change. We don't only learn that about John, it goes another step. John's spirit, he was known as one of the sons of thunder, right? If you've read your Bibles, known as the sons of thunder. He was enraged, he had a passion of anger, and he even had a desire for revenge. A desire for revenge. How do we know this? When the disciples, James and John, saw a Samaritan village, not welcome Jesus, here's they, how they responded. They said to the Lord, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Is that the kind of beloved apostle that you want in your life? Not me. Jesus turned, and guess what he did? He rebuked them. I mean, this is the apostle John, the beloved. And what that tells to me is this man doesn't start off very well. He doesn't start off very well. How many of you have started off very well? Not me. You get the point here? Jesus comes into this man's life, and this is what he does. Because despite his faulty ambitions, and despite his malevolence, Jesus, the God-man, the Lamb of God, the Chosen One, the One sent into this world to take away our sins, He wants to cleanse us. Amen? Do you get the sense that Jesus embraces John? I think he did. I think he embraced John, and I think he embraces you and me. How marvelous, how wonderful. Echoes of mercy, brothers and sisters. Not only echoes of mercy, but whispers of love. John experienced Jesus. He was embraced by him, and he had this vision, an incredible vision. And what does Revelation say? If you recall, this God who is coming soon, he tells us, I am coming soon. Do you believe it? The Spirit and the Bride, that's us, say what? Come. To those who hear, come. At the end of John's life, John was on an island, the Isle of Patmos. I think he would have looked into the heavenlies, this John, and he remembered as if it were the very day that he heard and saw and looked upon Jesus. And yet he was just a man from the crowd just like you and me, a man in the crowd. But Jesus prayed for him. When you think you're just one of the crowd, and please know this, please experience the fact that Jesus is praying for you. No matter how stressful it gets in the week, Jesus is praying for you. Jesus came to John. And I like this picture for a couple of reasons. Number one, I took it. It was in Jerusalem. And I was looking for dark and light, and I found it, and I praise God. And to me, we can step up the steps of darkness any day, right, brothers and sisters? But God says, I want you to walk in the light. Who wants to walk in the light today? Mark, you want to do it? I want to do it, right? Chris, you want to do it? I want to do it. I want to walk in the light, because he is in the light. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. Now I know, and you know, that John and the other disciples, they saw Jesus come into Jerusalem. They heard, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. But here's my question, and it's why I did the bubble effect on this picture. Yes, old people can do technology. (laughs) The reason I put the bubble effect here on this picture is this. Does John really see Jesus? I mean, do you really see Jesus? Do I really see Jesus? for who he truly is. Are we truly experiencing him? More importantly, do we believe? Jesus, of course, gave three and a half years of teaching to him. John would have known about the baptism of Christ. He would have had all these experiences. He would have been called. He had that experience. He would have seen the water being turned into wine. He must have reacted when Jesus turned over the money changers' tables in the temple. 
And what about when he saw Jesus heal a crippled man? Think about that experience. John saw this. In all of this, this man walked with Jesus. Are you walking with Jesus? Yes, you get it. That's not always easy because it gets muddy. But he did see a blind man healed. Can you imagine that? Lord, I want to see gay healed. We all do, Lord. There's this beautiful scene of Jesus with Mary and Martha. John would have seen this too. Remember the scene, Mary and Martha? Remember Martha? She comes up to the Lord. Lord, don't you care that my sister's left me to serve? Tell her to help me. And how does Jesus respond? Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. You know what? John saw that and he heard. John also saw Jesus raise a man, Lazarus, to life. And he would have seen it when the Greek said, we want to see Jesus. But how clearly do you and I see him? He saw when Jesus washed his feet and he felt the touch. He experienced the Last Supper so close he could actually touch him. He saw when Jesus was betrayed. He saw the trials of Christ, the trials that lasted into the night. He saw the beating of Jesus. He saw Jesus mocked. He saw Jesus nailed to a cross. And then there's this scene. John the Apostle was at the foot of the cross with Mary, the mother of God. Can you imagine experiencing that scene? And Jesus says from the cross, Woman, behold your son. He's speaking to John the Apostle. And then he said to John, Behold your mother. This is, I think, what John would have experienced. This woman who's losing her beloved son. She would have seen that. He would have seen that. Powerful experiences. Most importantly, John saw Jesus die on a cross. Full circle. Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. This painting to me is profound in so many ways. It's John and the women and Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And I get the point here is that they're touching Jesus. It's powerful, isn't it? That they pull this man down from the cross. And my favorite painting, for all this hearing and seeing and looking and touching, when the frightened men hid in their room in Jerusalem, a woman who believed came back to them and said, he's risen, and they still doubted. So can you see the hands of John there clasped? He's hoping against hope that it's true. And he runs first to that tomb and he finds it empty. But guess what? Jesus still calls and he calls him even at the water's edge so that Peter and these men can fish again. Full circle. Jesus comes into our life. I don't know what your profession is, whether you're clerical or whether you're in inventory or whether you're a struggling musician or whether you're, let me see if I can get this right, mom, nanny, whether you're in insurance marketing, whether you're in cars. (laughs) Jesus comes full circle. He comes into our lives because he wants us to experience him. John was called. Yeah, he was taught and he heard. He was exposed to all of Jesus. I get that, Lord. This man, he saw and he looked. He had the full experience of you. You, Lord, turned the mundane to the marvelous. You turned the commonplace to the uncommon. And you, Jesus, turned the everyday to the extraordinary because that's the kind of picture that you presented to these men. With all of his senses, John experienced Jesus. An old man, yes, but he hasn't forgotten any of that experience in his life. He looks back in this epistle. He has heard Jesus. He's seen Jesus. He's looked upon him. He's touched him. John knew, and that's why he could proclaim in verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, 
which we've seen with our eyes, do you get this? Which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. John was taken from the darkness into the light. Who wants that today? Who wants it? And it does, it catches us by surprise. Who wants it? Honestly, I think sometimes we don't want it. Because we still yet haven't experienced Jesus. But we still yet need to even more. So what is our experience? What breath has Jesus actually breathed into our lives? What life do we have? And how awake, can I ask this question everybody? How awake is your soul today? How awake is our soul? And how much have we seen of the Lord? How much have we heard? Would you join with me in just saying this? Awake my soul. Awake my soul. Let's stand as we sing together. As we see this uh, next verse come about, I placed it side by side with verse 1 because I wanted to show it visually to you in entirety. And in a sense, it matches verse 1. It's a balance. At the end of verse 1, you'll see that little dash. Can you see that? There's a little dash at the end of verse 1. And there's one at the end of verse 2. 
And that, va- that dash is to understand that John is pausing. He's pausing. So he's told us, he's proclaimed the eternal Lord Jesus, but he doesn't want to finish there. He doesn't want to stop. He actually wants to continue the message. He's not ready to move on yet. He replays this experience, and here's what he says. For life was made manifest, and we've seen it. He just told us he already seen it, right? He's telling us again, we've seen it, and we testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. He's not ready to move to verse 3 yet because he still wants to experience Jesus. Do you still want to experience Jesus? I do too. Jesus became evident in his life, brought to this life on earth, but know this, Jesus was brought to this life on earth, but he was always present. Amen? Amen. I know that's true because John says so. That which was from the beginning. So he's always been present. Even this morning I said to the group, sometimes we pray this, Lord meet us here. It's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? Because he's always here. Right? And yet we say to him, meet us here. (laughs) No. Jesus is always here. I think Jesus is saying to us, meet us here. There is a decisive moment in time though, isn't there? A decisive moment in time when John the Baptist says to John the Apostle, look, behold the Lamb of God. Powerful. And the sight of Jesus comes flooding back to John's mind. He's not ready to go to verse 3. Verse 2 continues the message of verse 1 then. He's so impacted by the experience, he says this, I testify to it. And not only that, he would say it in this way, I testify to it, I testify to it, I testify to it. It is true. Now, for all of you who have had a child, I put this painting up here. Man, I I searched high and low for a painting of a mother with a child. And so many of them are so opaque, they're so statue-like, I don't see the connection, but this one grabbed me. Now, for all of you who've had a child, you've had an experience, which is what John is talking about in verse 1. He's had an experience, and I believe that women understand this issue. They have an experience. And then the child gets passed, right, from uncle to aunt and to cuz, right, to grandpa and grandma, and eventually to dad, right, and then the child gets brought back into the mother's arms. And then everybody leaves. And that's what happened last night for Lionel Goo. Everybody left, and it's just him and Kay. And he's having an experience, right? So we go through these experiences of life, and this woman here, like most women, have had an experience. Do you get what I'm saying here? And when everybody's left, here's what you would say. You would look at that child, and you would say, my God. An expression comes about. No one tells you to do it, right? No one sends you to, here's what you need to say when you've had a child class. It just comes out of your heart. My God. It's her personal testimony. And I think this is what is going on with the Apostle John. He's had an experience. And unlike this woman, he's seen who? The Son of God. Do you get it? He has a testimony that's true. I testify. This is true. I've seen him and I've heard him. It's true. And it's kind of private, that statement in verse 2, I testify. It's a blessed assurance. Moms, when you hold, when you've been with your child for nine months, right? You probably had some doubts, right? That's humanity. But when that child is fully there, it's like, thank you. The realization is fully realized. You have a blessed assurance. And this is what happened to the Apostle John. That's his story. That's his song. Time enough for verse 3. John's life has changed. No longer in bondage to sin. No longer in the darkness. John is in the light. He testifies to it. Why? Because he's met the light. The light of God's life giving grace and his love. And no wonder visions of rapture burst on his sight. And he recalls echoes of mercy 
and whispers of love. In the privacy of his experience, which does flow to us, I get that, John, but in the privacy of your experience, you are filled with God's goodness. You are lost in his love. Look at this picture. Isn't it incredible? It shows the gathering momentum. That's what's happening in verse 2, brothers and sisters. He's experienced Jesus. He's testifying to him, but something else greater is yet going to happen. But the wave is just getting to the top. It has the feel of starting slowly, but it will grow large in verse 3. John wants people to hear. He wants to proclaim. That will come. He could have kept his experience to himself, right? He could have done, but he doesn't. He wants it to take on a deeper role. Why? Because the word of testimony of experience has changed him and it will become an authoritative commission. And what is that commission? To proclaim the eternal life. And he underscores that more fully. Who made this word of life manifest to us? Who? God did. God made this life manifest to us. It was the Father. Thank you, God, for doing that. And whom was this great work intended for? For you and me. Do you believe? I think John brilliantly shows us in two ways the object of his affections. Why? Because he's assured. Do you have that assurance this morning? Yes, he's assured from the beginning. Yes, he's experienced. Yes, he's seen Jesus manifested. He's seen all of the testimony of Jesus, the proclamation of the Father. He knew that Jesus could have stayed with the Father, but he knew that Jesus came to us. The gathering wave of experience and testimony is reaching forward and gathering pace. Why? He knows it. Because he's loved. Because Jesus embraces him, even though he was a man of anger and a man of ambition. Wow. That is blessed assurance. That is blessed assurance. Sing with me. Oh, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. It was salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit. This is my story, this is my song, pleasing my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Let's stand. The perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture. Now burst from my side Who oh, angels descending Bring from above Echoes of mercy Whispers of love This is my story this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior.
perfect submission. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I am my Savior and happy and blessed. And watching the waiting, looking up. It's good. to ask Brother Eddie if you have had an experience of Jesus I know this man he would say not only did I have an experience I testify to it it's the truth because he's touched your life and he's touched so many other lives right Eddie and that's their experience here on 61 guys these two verses together one and two give us the experience and testimony. I don't want to tell you as a pastor that you need to go out and share your testimony because that places a burden upon you. Although I hope you do share your testimony. My hope for you is experience Jesus. Do you get it? I believe if you experience Jesus, guess what? A testimony will come. I hope we don't get in the way ever. I really do. We can do that, I know that. I hope we never get in the way of you experiencing Jesus. Experiencing Him is the most incredible thing. Christ embodies the real life. And I get the fact that John does everything in his craft of writing to bring something beautiful to us, and it is beautiful. But it's not because he sought out to do that by way of obligation. I believe it happened because God spoke into his life and he couldn't help but write. Wow, that's powerful. That's life manifested to us. That small line at the end of verse 2, he's been holding off verse 3, but now he's ready to give us verse 3. That which we have seen and heard. Wait, you've been telling us that already, John. And you're going to tell us again? Yes because you can never say enough about what you've seen and heard. That which we've seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Proclamation. He's still talking about his experience. He hasn't moved on into practicalities of life, right? Seven steps, three steps, ten steps. He still cannot help but share his testimony. And whereas before he said what we've heard and seen, now he says what we've seen and heard. But it doesn't matter about the order. It's about the emphasis. Because what happened in the past when he was a young man still affects him today when he's 90 years old. Tell me you can find that kind of power anywhere else, anybody. Can you? No. That's amazing to me that this man is still affected and affected by what Jesus did in his life. Yes, he saw. Yes, he heard. And no longer private. Not like that mom who's in a hospital room who says, Lord, this is my child. Thank you, Lord. She wants to get on the phone to her friends and say, I had a baby. She wants to proclaim it. 
Again, does mum go to proclamation about your baby school? Right? How do I tell people about the fact I had a baby? I need seven steps and I need to go to a four-week seminar. No. <laughs> she just gets on the phone to a friend, Mary. I had a baby! And there's joy that comes from that, amen? Such is the power of Jesus when he comes into our lives. We proclaim to you. It's the main verb of this whole section. It's a message of proclamation. But it's a proclamation about Christ based on Christ, source in Christ, fountainhead is Christ. you get the point? This is about Jesus. And he's so emphatic that he says, I want you two to have this as well. It's not only for the readers then, but it's for us today. You know why? Because Jesus is too good to keep to himself. He is mm-mm good. What does John proclaim? That you two may have, may continue to have, to have eternally an everlasting having, which is what? Fellowship. It's a partnership, I get that, but it's more than that. It's communion. It's not just being nice or saying the right things on Tuesday morning, but it's having each other in our hearts. Where is he? Where's Brad? Is Brad here? He has to do something. God bless him. I wanted to make that point for Brad today. I have you in my heart. Where does such fellowship come from? God. John has been moved from darkness to light. He's seen and heard. Jesus is still affecting him. And if you experience Jesus, if he becomes your testimony, won't a sense of proclamation flow? I cannot tell you how many times Eddie comes into me and say, hey, I've got this chance to share with my Mexican friends or friends down in Cali or that. It just flows out of you, right, brother? And I don't think that's because you're obliged because I believe that Jesus has affected you. You've had an experience of him. It's ministry, actually. This is ministry. This is ministry. But it's a ministry of fellowship. A ministry of fellowship. It doesn't start with obligation. It doesn't start with duty. It doesn't start with demands. No, any ministry starts with Jesus. Amen. It's not about projects or assignments. And you, Father, know there are so many projects and assignments here. But it's a ministry of fellowship. A ministry that starts not with obligations, but with you. And I know this to be true from this verse in 1 Corinthians 1.9. Look at this. God is faithful. That's where it starts. You know, when we're having problems or you're having problems in any kind of work or family or ministry, we may think, just roll up the sleeves and try better or turn up on time or all of those things. But it really starts with this, God is faithful, amen? And it's through him that we were called into fellowship, fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. I get that. It's so powerful. Are you seeing today Jesus and the transformation that was brought about in John's life? I hope so through these songs and through this ministry of words. John has seen him. He said it three times, if you get the point. That which begins by experience and flows into testimony, gathers momentum and pace, and it comes out in proclamation. So now I can ask this. Do you want to shout to the Lord? Do you want to shout to the Lord? I mean, I think I do. I mean, I shouted to the Lord when England beat Sweden. And I shouted again when we lost to Croatia. (laughs) But those shouts will never be as loud as when I realize what you've done in my life. When you have seen Jesus in your life, when you have heard, what's your testimony? What wondrous things has he done? When you drive home today, could you just share what God has done for you? What fellowship have you had? Proclaim to him, shout to the Lord. Would you stand up, please? You know this song, right? Shout to the Lord. Because we want the whole earth to sing. Amen.
nothing, nothing compares. This is why it's fellowship in the light. You may seat, you may sit even. <laughs> fellowship in the light of God's life-giving love. Do you sense how much God loves you today? Because we can look at this man, John, and say, that guy was a man of earthly ambition, that guy was a man of malevolence, but what you do, Lord, is change his malevolence to benevolence. Wow, that's powerful. You took him from the dark and you put him into the light. And that's what you want to do with all of us. And that's the journey that we take in the next slide. We understand, hopefully today, that from our experience of God comes testimony, and from our testimony, proclamation. I don't want you to just do these things because you're supposed to do them. Make sense? Does that make sense? We have an equip and uh, training conference this weekend. But my hope this weekend is that you'll experience Jesus in the scripture that is given, and from that you'll have a testimony that comes out of your Ohana groups, and you'll proclaim it in those meetings that we have. Amen? That's my hope. And then we'll have this beautiful thing. It's called joy. Amen to that, right? Brian gets it. I get it. Now, with all of that proclamation, John the Apostle could have just gone home, right? Hey, I proclaimed it. Done my job. Everything that he's written from verse 1 to 3 is now given a purpose. And he's not a heaviness of heart. Some of us may have left a hospital room with a heaviness of heart. Some, may, some of us may have left a hospital room with sorrow. I get that. But John looks back on his life not with sorrowness or even heaviness, but he looks back with joy. Isn't that beautiful? It's gladness. It's a calm delight. Joy has its source in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You remember the three wise men who came from Bethlehem? Three wise men came to Bethlehem. You know why? Because a star pointed the way. And when they saw that star, what happened? They rejoiced with exceeding great joy because they knew they were being pointed to Christ. Chuck, today, have you been pointed to Christ today? There's joy flowing. I know that would be with Chuck because just hang out with Chuck. It's a beautiful thing because joy came into his life. And like those three wise men or more, they rejoiced when they saw the star. Heaven has joy when one sinner repents. It's a joy that can never be taken away. When my wife came to Christ, months later, she said this, does the feeling ever go away? That's what struck her. Does the feeling ever go away? It's the joy that happens when you ask of God and he supplies. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask that you may receive and your joy may be full. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit, amen? But it comes after the fruit of love. If there is no fruit of love, there will be no joy. If I goof up, if I make a mistake and you don't feel joy, it's probably because I didn't love you and I apologize. Make sense? But if you're feeling joy, please know this. The love I have for you only comes because he first loved me. John was a man once in the darkness. He had earthly ambitions that caused strife amongst brothers and he had an anger that sought revenge. Jesus rebuked him for that, but he still loved him. Wow. We're all broken. We all have pain. We all feel like mourning, but Jesus will turn our, turn our malevolence to benevolence because there's joy ahead. Amen? I love this next picture. These Middle Eastern peoples, to me, have this calm delight. 
they have joy. Now, John writes these things so that our joy may be complete, but I don't think he's just saying, hey, I write these things so that our joy may be complete. Thank you very much for helping me have my joy. And I don't think he's either saying this, I write these things so that your joy may be complete. I think it's more than that. I think it's both. He wants our joy to be shared. And if our joy is shared, guess what? Then it is complete. Does that make sense? If it is shared, then it is complete. We, let me say this. We only know we are broken when the light shines in. We only know we're broken when the light shines in. What's Jesus doing today? <laughs> Shining in. Your darkness, my darkness, cannot overcome his light. John chapter 1. Our darkness cannot overcome your light. That's amazing to me, Lord. Break through, Jesus. There's beauty in our brokenness because what we once grasped for and took, what we thought was good, Lord, we now know when your light shines in, there is beauty. The beauty isn't in our brokenness, it's the beauty that comes in our brokenness. But we can say this, I've got joy instead of mourning. No longer captured in our darkness, we're set free. No longer in pain, because love is here. Let's sing of joy today, not because you have to, not because I'm telling you to, not even because it's a good experience. I mean, it's a good experience thinking about joyful things. But sing because of Jesus, and sing to Jesus. Take every pronoun in this song, if you will, and reflect that it's Jesus you're invited to sing to. Because this is a soy, a, a soy, it is a song. <laughs> joy cometh in the morning. It is a song of joy. And I hope you get a chance to hear this song in YouTube or something, because it's pretty cool, isn't it? But I think it's going to be pretty cool here today. It's a new song. Lane, take us away in a song of joy. I want to call the ushers forward as we uh, take this time to collect our offering as well. Yes. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, 
attention I think this morning the biggest thing was that we as believers have the opportunity to say one word one name we have the privilege we have the opportunity we have the authority the name is Jesus and when we say Jesus it brings comfort to our hearts that may be hurting right now it also brings calm to the storms that we're in so this week when you're going through something I just want you to say Jesus Jesus because one is he's a gentleman and won't force his way in but you're inviting him by saying Jesus and two is there's nothing more comforting than that so will you join with me this morning as we pray Jesus we love that name the name above all names the name that allows us to enter into the holy of holies the name that we can use to just make the enemy flee that can cause us to have peace and comfort. And Father, we pray that now. We pray especially for those who are hurting, who need healing. We think of Gay. Lord, I've, all week long, she has been on my heart. And Lord, we want to decree and declare healing to her body. We want to say she is whole now in Jesus' name. We want to say that whoever is having um, issues with anything in their body, we speak and declare healing over them. We speak and declare, Lord, that you are the, the name above all names, that you are the one that we can come to when our hearts are hurting because we've lost loved ones. Mm. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you that your grace and your mercy is new each and every day. We thank you for your wisdom, Lord, and we just pray that you would give all those in authority from our president to the lowest person that serves in, the, uh, in a government position, that you give them wisdom, Lord, and how to lead this country. We pray, Lord, for the elections that are coming up, not only here on the island, but all across this great nation. We ask, Lord, that you put people of love and people of grace, people of, mer of mercy, and people who love you in those offices, Lord. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you do. We cannot, there, there's nothing more wonderful than you. And there's nothing that we can say or do that can bring any more praise to you than what you've already received 
Today, Lord, we want to lift your name on high and proclaim that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that all of the things that we are dealing with, Lord, you will take care of them because you've already done it. It's already set in stone. It's already taken care of. And today, Lord, we give you all glory, all honor, and all praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, don't leave. Don't leave. This is a ministry of fellowship. Yeah. And you get that. And Patty wants to pray. Chuck wants to pray. There's a spirit that's moving in the church now. We want to pray. So as you leave today, leave. But leave in prayer. Leave in prayer. We're giving you some space today, though, to come up here and pray. So we're not just leaving today. Uh, you may. Please do. The thing that has laid on my heart the most is that we as people are believers gathered together. And when we are done with this service, we just leave. But there's some of you who are hurting. Mm -hmm. There's some of you that just need to say, I need prayer today. Yes, Lord. That's what we want to do. We want to line the altars with people who will pray for you and let you know when you leave here today, you are not alone because the enemy will try to keep you in that atmosphere of thought that you're all by yourself in this and nobody else is going through it. Well, that's a lie and we want to break those lies today. <laughs> we want you to leave here whole and refreshed and knowing that you are never alone. You don't need to apologize because this is family, right? We love you. We hope we never get in the way of your joy of Jesus. We mean that. We hope we never get in your way when it comes to fellowshipping Jesus. Come forward when you want and we'll pray with you. And hey, you can pray for us too. So if you feel there to help others in prayer today, just come forward. Why? Because... We have the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. We pronounce this benediction upon you. Come to Jesus. That's the benediction today. Come just as you are. That there may be joy deep down in your soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless.